Ladies and gentlemen, our program will now begin. Please welcome the CEO of the Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much. And welcome to the Churchill Club. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are most privileged to have with us Reed Hoffman and Joey Ito. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Our thanks also to Citrix for hosting this gathering and for our long-term partnership, which has definitely strengthened our ability to carry out our work. For our new guests in the audience, a brief introduction to Churchill Club, a nonprofit devoted to innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. It began in Silicon Valley in 1985 as a place where important people say important things at the nexus of policy, business, and academia. And of course, over the years it has evolved just as technology itself has evolved to impact so many different aspects of our lives. So for 29 years, this organization has played a key role in convening people, exposing them to new ideas, and connecting them with one another. We um, thank our members and supporters here in the room. We could not do this without you, and we encourage others to please lend your support and help ignite more extraordinary conversations, such as the one that we're going to be part of this evening. Next up on May 29, it's the 16th annual Top 10 Tech Trends program with five leading venture capitalists who will share with us trends that are not obvious today, but they believe we will see explosive growth in about five years time. Next on June 3rd, we will present Dunn and Bradstreet CEO Bob Kerrigan in conversation with Jeffrey Moore, and they are gonna be talking about leadership and business transformation. If you're tweeting tonight, please do use the hashtag Churchill Club, and you'll find Twitter codes, other Twitter codes in your printed programs. Our speakers, Reed Hoffman and Joey Ito, share many common interests and bonds, as we'll soon hear. As entrepreneur, executive, and angel investor, Reed Hoffman has played an integral role in building many of today's leading consumer technology businesses. In 2003, he co-founded LinkedIn in his living room in Mountain View. Today, LinkedIn has more than 300 million users. Reed was also a founding board member and executive at PayPal and an early investor in Facebook, Zynga, and more than 80 other startups. Today, he is a partner at LinkedIn, or Greylock Partners, rather, an executive a chairman at LinkedIn, and he's on the, the many, many boards. <laughs> yeah. Zynga, Mozilla, Shopkick, Edmodo, Kiva.org, and also an, a board observer at Airbnb. And he was honored in 2010 with an SV Forum Visionary Award and named a Henry Crown Fellow by the Aspen Institute. Joey Ito is a leading thinker and writer on innovation, global technology policy, and the role of the internet in transforming society. He is director of the MIT Media Lab, a cross-disciplinary research lab that now is now in its third decade and has to be one of the coolest places on earth. And if you don't know that now, you will, I'm sure, after the conversation this evening. He is board chair of Creative Commons, and he sits on the boards of Mozilla Foundation, Sony, the New York Times Company, MacArthur Foundation, Knight Foundation, and Digital Garage, an internet company that he co-founded in Japan, among others. He was an early investor in more than 40 companies, including Flickr, Kickstarter, and Twitter. And among Joy's many honors, Business Week named him one of the 25 most influential people on the web in 2008, and he received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Oxford Internet Institute in 2011. Please give your warmest Churchill Club welcome to Reed Hoffman and Joy Ito. So I thought I would uh, kick this off um, with the story about how Joey and I met uh, because it actually uh, was a similar pattern of thinking that ended up in the founding of LinkedIn, which is uh, Peter Thiel, who was the CEO of PayPal, came to me and said, you know, we're just not figuring out Japan. It's getting slower and slower. I keep getting longer and longer dates for when we're going to launch. You know, 
can you go figure this out and get Japan launched? And I was like, okay, well, let me go find out what's going on. And I went and discovered that we were doing the classic thing that a company does when they're kind of unknown, which is we had hired some lawyers to give us the risk factors. And each week, the lawyers would give us a longer list of risk factors, <laughs> right? And give us more reasons why uh, trying to launch PayPal in Japan was a disastrous idea and why we should possibly you know, not do this. And I knew that Peter would uh, literally go ballistic if I walked back with that answer. And I was like, okay, how do I solve this problem? Well, obviously the problem is we, have, we need an entrepreneurial person, uh, not lawyers, so let me figure out the best person I know. And I literally called every smart person I knew who knew about Japan and said, give me the list of the three best people you know who are entrepreneurs, who understand Japan, who you know, I could use to figure out this path. And I found on three of them, uh, uh, was all headed by this guy, Joey Ito, right? Uh, and I was like, all right. So I called those three back and I said, okay, which of you have the best relationship with Joey? <laughs> Found out which one. I said, oh, I know Joey really well. Great. Intro me to Joey, please. And so um, we had an email introduction, got on the phone, and I said, look, I... This yeah. is because you didn't have LinkedIn then, right? Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> precisely. Well, this is the kind of pattern that led to thinking about LinkedIn uh, and why it might, might be an interesting product and useful to people. And, um, and so... Uh, Basically, I uh, got on the phone, I said, look, uh, I know that, because uh, Joey at the time was, had started a venture firm called Nyotny, which is an awesome, like I actually, for the intellectually wonkish, like this wonderful name, um, uh, which it has to do with the theory of humans and human intelligence and plasticity and whatnot, and you can look it up later, it's not really relevant for tonight. And, uh, um, and so I was like, I don't have, really have anything uh, uh, to really offer you because we don't really do anything with venture. But if you had portfolio companies or something else, you know, we PayPal, can, can you help us with this problem? And Joey's like, no, no, no problem. I like helping entrepreneurial efforts. I think I got the right guy. Let me, let me go check in with him and I'll get back to you. And he literally got back to us with a guy that was, the, was like, the, we got, this guy arranged for us to get a letter from the Japanese Financial Services Authority that said, you can launch yen, but as long as you don't launch Japanese, we won't judge you to be doing business in Japan so you can start getting data and start having accounts and everything else so that you can start getting the traction, start setting your product, and you can work out the kind of issues around banking later. It's literally the only country in the whole world where we got this kind of like clarity of not like, because one of the problems, by the way, in the rest of the world, uh, more so than the US, is that going afoul of banking regulation is what I called orange jumpsuit time, which is criminal, <laughs> not just civil. So you could land at the airport and be put in handcuffs and taken away. So getting this right was really important. That was really helpful. And then, uh, <laughs> and so I was like, hey, call him back. That was really helpful. Anything I could do. He's like, well, I'm coming out to San Francisco. You want to have coffee? I'm like, yeah, that's easy. And you know, that's how it, uh, that's how it started from, uh, told from my perspective. So with that, um, with Joey, uh, I give him a much simpler intro than the one that uh, you just heard. Of course, the one you just heard is accurate. My intro of Joey is college dropout, director of the MIT Media Lab. <laughs> right. So, why did you take the Media Lab job? How did you come to it? And how does a college dropout end up being the director of the MIT so, Media Lab? Um, so, I, I was... So first of all, I never thought I would be in academia. My, my sister's an academic. I was surrounded by academics. And I, I dropped out three times, not just once. I, so I tried. <laughs> so I knew very well that I didn't want to be an academic. Um, but uh, And now you tell people to finish the degree. No, I, I still think you should finish the degree. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I failed at yes. that. Um, but, uh, um, so, but they, they, they called me. I mean, I, they asked very casually whether I would be interested. And I said, well, of course I'm interested in anything, you know. But when they officially called me in, I, I had no idea, you know, whether I would be interested. But it was amusing enough that a uh, university like MIT would even consider having a college graduate be their, the director of their lab. And so I went in and then we just, I, it was like two days of interviews, like 30 minute interviews with students and faculty and staff and the the quality of the conversation and sort of the energy was just addictive and I realized that you know there it was this it was a whole it's hard to explain we can go into this in more detail but but, but that was really what converted me and so very quickly they decided that I was the right person and I decided they were right and then there was a little 
a little bit of raised eyebrows as the process made its way through the institute. They said, um, when, I, when I went to meet the dean, um, the first thing she said was, so I hear you don't have a degree. <laughs> 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 but, but, but in the end, the, the provost, um, who was a person who had to kind of okay it, he said, I don't see any problem. And he's now the president of the university. But, um, but MIT's turned out to be super flexible. I think, um, um, I think I'm the first non, non degree holder in the sciences. I think there's probably somebody else in the humanities, but. Well, I told you this, but one of the funniest parts of that experience for me was uh, I was one of your reference calls. Oh, right. And they called me and they said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, I'm trying to hire him. <laughs> 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 but what else do you want to know? <laughs> so, right, right. Um, but why do you think, I mean, we're going to touch on this at multiple points throughout this, but uh, what's your beginning statement about why the Media Lab matters? Like, why is it kind of in the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years mm -hmm. in terms of what we're trying to create in the world? That's kind mm -hmm. of the more fundamental intellectual reason you took it. And I think yep. we should start with that. Yep. Um, so, and I think you're similar, and correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, but the reason I got into entrepreneurship, a lot of it was to try to create impact yep. um, and to disrupt. So, because I was in television and, and media and f surrounded by big companies that were moving slowly and destroying value, in, in, in my view. And so, to me, creating disruption. Actually, your specific line was, I'm an anti-monopolist. I'm an anti-monopolist, yes. yes. And, 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 and to me, as a 20-something tw year old, having come out of these large institutions where 20-something year olds didn't have any leverage, internet companies was a really great way to disrupt television and, and all these other things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, as I was doing venture, though, I also saw some limitations to the kinds of things you could do. So, you know, there, there was a certain category, a profile of a good fundable startup. And you start getting to where you, and, and you know, and there, there, there's some room on the edges, but fundamentally, you, you know, they have to have a certain scale, they have to have a certain kind of cash efficiency, and, and there's a certain thing about it. But then when I got to the Media Lab and I looked at what they were doing, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that was disruptive and important that wouldn't be venture funded, that could be venture funded eventually, but it's especially in the exploratory phase, and there are a lot of different dynamics. And maybe because the person who invests in it isn't necessarily the one who's gonna benefit, so because so, the ideas go out into the commons. It could be because it's super high risk. It could be because it takes a long time. Um, or it could be because it's just, you know, it, it, so there's a bunch of different reasons. And so I realized that, that just doing Silicon Valley venture wasn't gonna solve all the problems. And there's a whole other problem space of impact that needed to be addressed. And that I knew a lot of smart people were here working on the, on the Silicon Valley problem, but I didn't see, it, the, the Media Lab was weirdly unique enough for me to realize that that, that was worth trying to get right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's, I mean, because this is something, I mean, one of the key things is innovation is part of the future. If you don't, with the increasing Moore's Law, uh, you know, or just Moore's Law, and then the increasing top rate of companies, the question is classically you have to reinvent. So the question of where innovation and where invention comes, and there's mm -hmm. universities, mm -hmm. and then there's corporate labs, and then there's startups. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you mentioned, part of the whole thing in terms of startups is, look, startups have this one mission, focused amount of capital, usually it's take an invention and go to market with it, like figure out how the product market fit works, you know, build a team around that, try to, like the, the build something as a commons for the platform or to do R&D and just figure out something that any other people could use, that's actually not where that model goes. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, how much, you know, there's, there's obviously classically all the things with Xerox and everything else from the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the history books, but mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's still some interesting place where, where corporate models have at least generated value and maybe there's something to do. But one of the really key things is to figure out how universities can do that. And of course, classically universities uh, kind of go, well, we're kind of separate and it's pure thinking and, and mm -hmm. we're separate from those considerations. And that's actually one of the things that I think has led to a certain amount of failure mm -hmm. about the invention of things. And I think one of the reasons why, you know, to prompt you, the Media Lab was like, no, no, we're actually, we're actually building stuff. We're actually not trying to just do, you know, kind of like scholastic research, but actually mm -hmm. things that actually you know, bear on target. Right. That was actually one of the f only weird meetings I had when I joined MIT. The dean of science was a family friend, and he called me into his office. And he said, 
I question the scholarship in the media lab. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> Best thing I've heard all day. <laughs> but, um, but, but, but I think, I think it, 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 that's the thing is like most university departments are very focused on scholarship. And, and then at MIT, which is more applied than most places, it's an institute, you have labs that are funded through grants, and then you have the academic departments, which are about the scholarship. And there's like this healthy church and state kind of tension. Um, but the Media Lab, they completely hacked the system by creating a lab that also has its own academic program. And we're primarily funded by companies. So we have 80 companies that pay a consortium membership. And so we have like three visits a day from companies. And our students spend all day um, building and then explaining what they're doing to companies. So all day long, they're they're getting input, and and then the, and the companies are hugely, um, you know, acro varied across the spectrum. So we have everything from Lockheed Martin to Hasbro to, um, you know, Fox News to, um, you know, the Knight Foundation. So and Google and Google. That's yeah, right. Just Google. Be local. Just, yeah, just be local. <laughs> and, and Samsung and LG and Nokia yeah. and so so. It, so what's what's interesting is it's, it's it, we get tons of commercial constraints mm -hmm. and real world input, um, and and then the, and then the other part is because we have this academic program that's wrapped in a in a um, uh, a lab, um, we have different faculty have different levels of this, but we we can if we want to um, have less focus on the scholarship wh where the scholarship comes as a byproduct mm -hmm. of impact rather than the experiment being the or the doing being a byproduct of the, 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 the I, I call it practice over theory. I, I'm much more interested in things that work in practice but not in theory, mm -hmm. rather than the other way around, mm -hmm. which is where a lot of people from other universities end up, which is they have a lot of theory that don't work mm -hmm. in practice. Yeah. I'd rather have it the other way around. One of my favorite expressions, as you know, is in theory there is no difference in theory and practice. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so you're the philosopher. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. So what, um, let's actually uh, briefly detour to how do companies interface with the Media Lab? Like what, is, what, is that, what does that look like? So different companies interface in different ways. So, so, so the core model is we get you know, $250,000 from 80 companies mm. that makes up, so that's kind of the entrance ticket. Mm. And for that you get a non-exclusive right to all of our intellectual property, which is you know, maybe useful. I mean, we've got, we had e-ink and we had some things, but that's not our primary focus is to generate. IP, but it's so that when you're in a meeting, anything that's generated, you know you can go back home and use. Um, and then we have two annual meetings where it's like the grand ball, where all 450 demos are running and you get to see all the research updates and things like that. But then throughout the year, the companies interact with us. Um, and some companies will fund students and fund projects, but the interactions are kind of interesting. And this is, you know, it's, it's sort of hard to say on the record, but it's, it's just, it's true, which is that, um, because the core funding, we don't have actual deliverables, they're not grants. So most of my students and faculty don't have deliverables. So they're trying to create answers to questions that the companies don't know to ask yet. Um, so what we're trying to do is discover things that they haven't really thought of yet. And the, and the math works out to, for the cost of a fully loaded engineer, you're getting about four or 500 scientists working on 450 random projects that may or may not have value to you right away. But some companies use it as a hedge against being completely wrong. Like the Japanese were all focused on um, analog high definition for a long time. And the Media Lab was the one that kept saying, no, no, it's going to be digital. Analog's not working. And they showed them. And the Japanese company said, oh, maybe we should pivot. You know? So there's some, of the, some of it is that um, there's like e-ink for the Kindle created, you know, the, the whole e-book thing. So there's sometimes looking at new trends. A lot of the wearable stuff came from the lab. And some of the companies get inspired and do their own thing. Some companies like Samsung hires, so the, the people who worked on the Samsung watch, that team's ours, Google Glass. I mean, Google hires a lot of our people, so a lot of the, the, the know-how goes out that way. Um, and then some of the companies just network with each other, so it's kind of like a club. Um, so di different companies have different things. And some companies just come in when they have an innovation surge, when they're trying to do, be very innovative. They bring all their senior management in, and for a couple years they interact with us. Or some companies like Toshiba have been members for like, 29 years. And but usually it's an interactive model rather than a kind of like an outsourced lab. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so we don't, we definitely don't do what you tell us to do. Yeah. Um, and, and, <laughs> and what... I think that's almost by definition yeah, for and, how and, it works. And, what, and what's interesting is there's a certain category of company who just pays, they come to the shows, 
but then it's kind of like a brand thing where this, mm. a couple of the senior people come and they see, and, and they get some value out of mm. it, but they're actually the ones that fund the other category of companies who come and engage aggressively. Mm. And, and, and it's, a, it's what's interesting is it's a competition of ideas. So if you come in with really interesting data, mm. you, s students will swarm around it, you know, or if you come in with a really interesting idea, um, you'll get a whole bunch of people working on it. So the really cool ideas and the really cool companies end up getting sort of an unfair share of attention. The cool thing about cool at the Media Lab is it's not what you would normally think. So, you know, an accounting company could get a, a swarm of students. Like we can talk about this later, but like the MIT Bitcoin Club, right? Mm -hmm. So what you have with that are hundreds of nerds interested in bookkeeping. That's basically mm -hmm. what you have. And so suddenly <laughs> they want to know, they want to meet accountants, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, so, so for me, what's interesting about looking at which companies are doing well with which ideas mm -hmm. is to see the sort of variety of the stuff that kids geek out on. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and, it, and it's also like, like, you know, one of my students who's just the, the biggest nerd in the world, he, he, you know, he, he, he was hacking on a, a, on a, on a Volkswagen, um, on an Audi, and they got so excited by his like two day hackathon thing. They, they, they gave him a free Audi and he's driving around and he's fully insured and I'm like, you don't want to give him a, a car, you know? <laughs> yes. but, 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 it, but I think it's interesting. That's what's fun is when, you bring, when the companies bring a toy in and then they see the Media Lab students swarm over it. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the key point about the lab is that because it's undirected, no one asks permission. There isn't a single PowerPoint, there isn't a single presentation, everybody just does stuff. And so what happens is as soon as there's interaction, sometimes, They'll come in the next day, and the thing will be done. And then it's like, okay, well, what, do, what do we get to do next? And so, so that's that's kind of what you're shooting for. So let's uh, shift a little bit to kind of views of the future. So you know, one other when 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 Joe and I were chatting about what are the things that would be interesting with folks here, one of the things we realized is from a Silicon Valley perspective, looking over at the Media Lab, mm -hmm. what are the things that you're saying that that would be interesting for us to pay attention to? Well, I, I, so I think if you look at what was it, Annalise Saxenian's book about regional advantage, mm -hmm. about why Silicon Valley grew when you know the the loop failed, um, it, I think a lot of it had. The loop to, is a is a road in, outside of Boston. Yeah, I'm starting to talk yeah. like a Bostonian. Yes, I, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, it, but um, is. In the old days, to create anything like a video tech system, right, that looks would be would have been the version of the web before we had the web, would have cost hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars to do like a Minitel. It's probably hundreds of millions. So, in order to roll out something like that, where you're building everything from the bottom up, it would have cost it would have cost so much money that you would have had to really plan it. And so, you'd have an MBA write a plan, and then a company or a fund would fund it, and then you would hire the designers and engineers, and you'd build the thing and whatever. Um, as the cost of, well, so the internet made distribution, collaboration cost nearly zero, and Moore's Law made computation nearly zero. So suddenly what happens is the cost of trying something. So if you had done a Google, Facebook, or Yahoo before the internet, it would have been a $100 million upfront venture. In these cases now, you build the thing, then you raise the money, and then you come up with a plan, and then you go public. So it used to be, MBA money engineer, and now it's engineer money, and then MBA if you need to go public, right? Sometimes. Sometimes. So, and then I, I, I love, I love um, uh, first round capital's MBA as a service. You know. <laughs> <laughs> MBA, yes. Uh, but, but, but I think what, what's um, important, so, so that, that we know happened, on, and that, what happened was it pushed innovation out of the large institutions with the authority and the money into dorm rooms and startups and was venture funded, right? So that happened for the software and, um, and internet services. I think that's happening in hardware, where you're seeing that the, the, the prototyping costs, now the manufacturing costs, companies like PCH International that basically do supply chain are now open for business for venture. Um, AQS, all these guys are starting to open up manufacturing in Shenzhen to venture. Um, and then you've got interesting things like Kickstarter that completely changed the cash flow model that also screwed up 
uh, startups. So, for instance, you know, I, I, Form Labs. I'm an investor in that. It's one of our, our some of our graduates. But you know, they, I think they got three million in orders from Kickstarter before they started. So normally that would be the big weird chunk of funding that made hardware companies look different from software companies. Well. If you get the money first, then that goes away. So, so there's a bunch of parameters that have changed that I think make hardware ventures important. And then what I would say is also because you have to build them into an e ecosystem of software and network services, um, they have to be a little bit more software driven rather than hardware centric. So the traditional companies that had hardware expertise, like the mm -hmm. HPs of the world that had five year roadmaps and hardware are having a harder time than the people who think like software. So the big software giants, obviously Facebook, Google, Microsoft are obviously getting into hardware, but the more interesting component of it for me are the little startups. So that I think MIT and the East Coast tended to be good at that, but also I remember a lot of funds in Silicon Valley always used to say we don't do hardware. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's Other a little- Other semiconductors, but yes. yeah. Yeah, well, well they, they used to do hardware and then they started focusing more and more. Well, and, and software is a low hanging fruit from a yeah. sort of profile perspective. Yep. So my question, which is interesting, is I think we have an advantage right now, regional advantage in Boston on hardware just because we, we, we have a lot of that, but I see Silicon Valley picking up and catching mm -hmm. up. But there's a similar dynamic now with, soft, uh, with, with biotech, and I can go into the details if you want, but, but the, the cost of designing and deploying and innovating on, on bio stuff, like memories and sensors and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff, is going down. And, and that's another area that um, in, in the Boston, sort of Cambridge area, we, we have a lot of expertise. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see. It's not going to be exactly the same, but, but, but generally the, the diminishing of costs pushes innovation to the edges, which um, changes the architecture of innovation, and, and Silicon Valley is really good at it. I think Boston has some domain expertise in some of these new areas, so what will be interesting is whether we collaborate, does Boston, um, does the Silicon Valley catch up to Boston? So is that, I'm, I'm really interested in where that goes. Well, you might want to describe a little bit of Ed Boynton's work and yeah. the kind of the how computation is being directly integrated. I mean, the cybernetics <coughs> is taking yeah. entirely whole new levels. Yeah. So, so this this is um, this this is, uh, is par partially the um, the. Uh, the, I use the word anti-disciplinary instead mm -hmm. of interdisciplinary because interdisciplinary is when you get a chemist and a biologist and a mechanical engineer working together. Okay, well that's great, but it really doesn't work that well because they all use, they, they set their, they, it, what's really funny that I, because this science lab thing is, 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 is funny, is you, when you walk into, they all are looking at the same thing, but chemists, biologists, and physicists all set their microscopes differently. <laughs> <laughs> and they use slightly different words, and, and it's, it's interesting because they'll look at the same phenomenon, but they can't really talk about it in the same way. But when you're actually trying to do something, right, and this is, I think, what's important is a lot of our, all of our faculty have a mission. So Hugh is trying to make robotic limbs, Ed's trying to understand the brain. And what you find is, so, so for instance, in our lab we have a guy who does um, computational optics, and they do light field stuff, so like the Lytra camera, right? So there's, so all those guys that work on computational optics think about cameras all the time. Well, it turns out that there's a problem or an interesting thing, which is there's a nematode that is the first um, organism to have its connectome, the, the, the neurons um, mapped, because it has a small number of neurons. But what you really want to understand when you're looking at uh, uh, a brain is not how it's connected, is what's going on in it. So like it, a connectome is kind of like a, 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 a Google map of a snapshot, right? Uh, uh, but what you really want to know is who's driving and what are they thinking and, and you know, are they drinking and where, you know, where are they going? You want to interrogate the drivers. So, so you actually need to look inside the cells to see what's going on electrically, mechanically, and, and chemically. So we need to do real-time imaging. And so what happened is we had in the next lab, in, our, in the media lab, um, when the guy does the light field, he says, well, why don't we see if we can make a light field um, microscope to look at the neurons to then image the brain in real time and so we invented the first light field microscope and we applied computational optics to neurology. And, and, and the thing is, usually the best computational optics guys in the world don't hang around with the best brain guys in the world. You know, and, and now we're, we're working on trying to build um, circuits and putting them into the brain. And what gets really funky and interesting here is, is there's a computational element to trying to understand what's going on in the brain. 
There's also stuff that you might do electrically, and there are researchers doing the pieces of it, but what's, what's funny is it's, you're starting to see a hybridization where the really interesting solutions require understanding ele ele um, electronics, computation, and biology, and genetics. But what's really interesting is it's starting to become fungible, right? So it's like you can, there's like, so the, George Church, whose who's main position is at Harvard, but has a position with, with us at the Media Lab, I, you may have seen his demo. He wrote a book called uh, Regenesis. He encoded the whole book into a the gene of a, um, gene sequence of a bacteria by just recording base pairs as memory. So you could actually sequence the 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 bacteria and which he made seven billion of just so that he everyone could have a copy um, and 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 you could and, and, and you could read the book well it turns out chromosomes are higher density than hard disks and lower power mm -hmm. so an archiving company came to him and said well can you do video maybe he said okay so now he's designing a microbe that takes light converts it into uh, um, a protein that then takes a base pair and stores it. And what it, they're going to do is they're going to create a biological video archival system that all you have to do is sequence the, the gene hmm. and you can get, out, get the video out. Uh -huh. And it's extremely low power and extremely high density. So, so he's, his view is that a lot of computation is going to go into biology. Uh -huh. But then we have other people in the lab saying, no, we're going to use biology to make computer chips. And, then we, you know, and so, and so what gets really interesting is if you're trying to tackle a particular problem, like let's fix the eye. Uh -huh. Well, there's a genetic approach, which is what Ed in our lab is working on, which is to use um, this expression uh, to create a photo synthetically, photo, a, a, a photo um, sensitive nodule that gets attached to certain neurons you, um, transferred there by uh, a virus. So you would inject it and it would make your blindness okay. We've shown that this works in mice. Or you could build a robotic eye, you know. Or you could, you know. So, 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 so. But what's what's important about this is that that it doesn't work when you have these disciplines. You really have to break the disciplines apart. And and the and the key though is is not to allow it to be called interdisciplinary. And and so so this is this is not to bash the D school, but this is just the, to contrast it. Um, <laughs> Because <laughs> I, 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 I love the D school folks, and we, 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 work, we talk to them a lot. But the D school is having people in their disciplines come together in an interdisciplinary class to learn and then go back to their disciplines. So what we do is we're, we make people leave their disciplines. They may publish papers and things, but they become anti-disciplinary, and they're not allowed to say, I don't do that. I'm not a, you know, everybody codes. Everybody has to hold the pipettes. Mm -hmm. you, you have areas of co core expertise, but you're supposed to be fluid. And we, we have a degree program in anti-disciplinarism, which is, which is um, anyway, so I, I went off on attention. But I don't know, but that's actually part of the innovation. I mean, how do you put the, I mean, part of the thing is, I think you're right, the future is uh, engineering and design put together in a multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. anti-multi, yeah, you know, same yeah, thing, yeah. right? Um, where it's where it's integrated because the the key and for example when you were talking about MBAs one of the things that I actually remember that is whenever I give talks to MBAs one of the things I say as investors is two negative factors that as an investor two negative factors that need to be explained away for me to make an investment one's an MBA and the other one's a background in management consulting <laughs> um, and that's because it's this creation element it's what is the product that's kind of key to that and you actually need to have a multidisciplinary approach in order to get that because it's not elaborating a scholarship field. Mm -hmm. It's actually how do you solve this problem and what are the different kinds of resources that cause the right conceptual map and the right kind of technology mm -hmm. that can address it. Right, right, right. And that's part of what the, that's the reason why like I remember having my mind blown by going into Ed Point and Silla and going, yeah. oh my God, you're, you're tying computational stuff directly to the mouse's brain? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, yeah, but it turns out brains, throw off a lot of information. And so yes. one of the really key things is, well, it's, it's, it very quickly becomes a big data problem. And then it suddenly helps to have the, um, the storage unit of Toshiba as a sponsor, you know, because. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So let's go back to hardware briefly. Um, one of the threads that's also interesting so, I mean, obviously part of what's happening is software is beginning to infect everywhere. It's infecting biology. It's a question of direct hookups. Mm -hmm. It's a question of whether or not anything from do you build the computers biologically or do you build biological systems that are solving computational problems and how does that infect, mm -hmm. how do you affect encoding and decoding the genome is obviously part of this. I mean, all mm -hmm. that. 
it's also hitting hardware in interesting ways. And we mm -hmm. touched on it only very briefly yeah. with you know, PCH and all. And I think a little bit of what would be helpful for Silicon Valley folks mm -hmm. is for you to reflect a little bit of what you've seen from Shenzhen and yeah. other kinds of areas. Yeah, I think the Shenzhen story is key for us because one of the first places I'm trying to build a, a solid presence for us is in Shenzhen. <clears throat> and the reason is last year, in January, I sent a bunch of um, students along with um, Bunny Huang, who, if you don't mm -hmm. know, is he, he did Chumbi, but he was, he, he hacked, he's the one that hacked the Xbox um, and turned this machine that Microsoft was selling at a loss um, in order to sell games into a Linux machine, you know, mm -hmm. and, and Microsoft didn't like that and they sued and MIT protected him and so he's indebted to us, but no, but, <laughs> but, um, but he, but anyway, he, so he knows, he, he learned Shenzhen when he was doing Chumbi. So he took our students and what happened was amazing is they went there and it turns out that all the factories that make Adidas and iPhones, they're all sort of aunts and uncles that are networked together that run these factories. And um, you can buy anything and you could talk to anyone and get anything done. So that, that's, but what, what's amazing is that every single kid whose parents have enough money, like have a successful restaurant or something, the kid makes, not every, but most of them, they make a cell phone, right? And the cell phone design, so there's, if you go down to the stalls, there's just hundreds of cell phones designed, like Hello Kitty, like cars, like, you know, and, and, and so they, they make cell phones like kids in Palo Alto make websites, right? And what's also interesting is they don't sit there in a design room and design it, they sit there on the factory floor designing on the manufacturing equipment. So unless you have you know, tooling grease under your nails, you're not a designer. And what happens is every week they come up with another model, they go downstairs, they sell it at the stalls, they compare with each other, they go back. And they don't call it this, but this is A-B testing, this is agile development, and they make hardware like we make software. And what's, what's, what's also fascinating about it is there's, like the, there's this $12 retail price Shenzhen phone with five megabytes of RAM, um, MP3 player, quad band GSM, OLED screen, um, Bluetooth, e everything, right? And the only way you could make that, if you look at it, because there's no, there's no screws, it's just beautiful, but it's designed by somebody who stands in front of a manufacturing line all day long, thinking about how can I get this to do what I want. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things I changed, so, so um, when, I, when, I, when Nicholas Negroponte, who founded the lab, he famously said, you know, rest of academia is publish or perish, we are demo or die. And he would say, your demo only has to work once. That was his famous mm -hmm. saying. So, so I changed it recently to deploy or die. Mm -hmm. You have to actually take the stuff and send it out into the real world. So in the old days, because the cost of doing anything was so high, we would inspire these large companies to create Lego Mindstorms or Guitar Hero or the Kindle. But we wouldn't actually manufacture this stuff ourselves. Well, now. With Shenzhen, I realized that we don't have to sit there with a prototype that we can only make one of. We can make 100,000 of them and let people play with them and just go and, and do stuff. So, so, and and it's, it's already been true with websites. It's not true with hardware. And so, so, so I'm, I'm also trying to get some kids from Shenzhen to come to the lab to teach us as well because I think there's also this interesting thing where I think Apple has gone, I think it's been primarily Apple, but has cracked down on a lot of the pirates and a lot of these kids end up in jail because their side business is making mm. fake iPhones, right? <laughs> um, and, and, or iPhones that when you swipe, it turns into an Android, and when you swipe, it turns into an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> now, that would be a favorite. <laughs> but, but, um, so, but, I, but, but, but the, and so they don't realize that they are actually extremely far ahead of the rest of the world in a particular kind of innovation. And so I, I want to sort of bring them in and get them working with us. You know, some of the things, I mean, obviously, there's a bunch of stuff from the hardware-software combination that the Valley's been looking at. It's been, uh, obviously, wearables, uh, which mm -hmm. I think a lot, you know, a bunch of touch points from the, from the lab mm -hmm. there. Uh, I actually think one of the other things that is you've only begun to see in the, the fringe of it is special purpose hardware design for different things. Mm -hmm. And, like, one of the things on the on the Bitcoin side, and this isn't public, so I can't say any more information about this, but I know a venture firm that's funded an ASIC developer for Bitcoin mining, mm -hmm. right, as a, you know, kind of hardware specific in order to, to, to touch this. And, and I think that we're gonna see a lot more of that mm -hmm. in various ways. And it's one of the reasons why the principles of open source uh, applied to software now also becomes applied to hardware. 
and, the, the, and, and how that innovation loop works. Because once you can begin doing A-B testing, once you can begin doing, okay, I launch it, I try it, and I can do it cheaply, and I can launch it and try it and do it again, then all of a sudden the amount, the, the rapidity of the innovation cycle mm -hmm. goes way up and is almost categorically different. And that's, I mean, I think that that's one of the things that, you know, uh, I think we'll get added into the Valley Corpus. I'm not mm -hmm. positive. We tend to be, you know, it's, it's very close to software. It tends to be where we, where, where yep. most of gravity is, but, you know, hardware and biology are beginning to touch that. Yeah, but then you got the Tony Fidels, and you know, I mean, I think it's mm -hmm. also a software view of the world. Yep. Taking on hardware is going to be ultimately successful. Yeah, well, I think software is still key. I mean, that's part of how, like, when, for example, more or less the way that we look at this from Greylock is we say, well, we, do, we, we divide into practice of consumer and enterprise software, and we will do anything where software is the key part of it. Look, we will do hardware. We did Voodoo, David Z did his investment in Voodoo, and other um, uh, Toy Talk, which is trying to make your toys talk to you through iPads and so forth. Mm -hmm. But as long as software is the kind of key, key element of it, because that's the Moore's Law and the revolution cycle. Right. And by the way, same, similar things in terms of biology. Mm -hmm. you, you touched on something that I think might be fun, since I think Silicon Valley folks have been thinking about Bitcoin for a while. So what is this MIT Bitcoin thing and, and how have accountants become sexy? So, 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 so the MIT Bitcoin thing is, is actually a student. Um, so the, 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 some students made a thing called the MIT Bitcoin Club mm. and they went out and raised, um, I, I think last time I checked they had $500,000 um, from philanthropists um, who, and then they're gonna give $100 to every student that's in the club and um, to do whatever they want. And the idea, though, is so. So to me, Bitcoin is is a hack on bookkeeping. Really, it's taking a ledger-based bookkeeping system and making it feasible for the first time in its current form because of encryption. And, and it's 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 clever, but it's it's basically converting a, a bearer-based currency sort of mm -hmm. cash into a ledger system. And and the thing is that, like, and the, the only reason I'm, I'm obsessed by this is you know my friend Jay Devetti, because he was one of the first people we, 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 I, you met that was one of my friends, but, but, but he, he's, he's an Indian genius. He was the CIO of Shinsei Bank, and he was able, they, uh, Ripplewood, a foreign fu firm, bought the long-term credit bank of Japan when it was going bankrupt. He was able to cut the cost of the bank by 90% in 18 months by completely redoing all of the systems. The only reason he was able to do that is that he, is he's an accounting genius and a computer science genius. And the thing that's interesting was he told me his story, which was he was he was in school in India, and he was a whiz, and so he didn't study for his accounting class. And it was the first class where he didn't where he failed or didn't do well. And then he realized you can't understand underestimate accounting. Everybody thinks it's boring, but it's actually really hard. And so he then just obsessed about accounting. And so he and I would sit around, he'd talk to me about bookkeeping and accounting and, and how, and, and, and the fact that no one else nerds out that much in that space as computer science people, it has kept the financial services business so behind. We have banks and stuff that are designed and no one hacks them, right? So, so to me, Bitcoin- well, no one hacks them that way. There's no, another no, kind yeah, of hacking, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Good, good hacking, right? <laughs> yes. um, but, but so to me, why Bitcoin is, Bitcoin's interesting for a lot of reasons, but from a MIT perspective, why Bitcoin's interesting is not in, in itself, but that it is now driving a lot of really smart people to start thinking about really basic bookkeeping problems, which I think is gonna be the beginning of a fundamental change in the atomic units. Because everybody is kind of like, let's assume um, standard accounting systems. What can we hack? So option pricing, and so all the rocket scientists went into hacking a system on top of something that was actually pretty old. It's kind of like when you look at the computer chip companies. They let's let's assume a silicon crystalline wafer. You know, most of the the computer chip guys don't even know the physics and the phenomenon behind the memories that they work on anymore. And and very few companies can actually go in and open the black box. I mean, some of them do, but they're they're very few. And but so it, so accounting. And bookkeeping is kind of like the material science of money that a lot of smart people hadn't been focused on, but I think that now that they are, I think there's gonna be a huge wave. And to me, having a lot of random MIT undergrads mm -hmm. messing around is, is gonna generate, because th the problem is if you come from the old mm -hmm. financial world, it's really hard to think about a world built up of you know, 
bits instead of atoms. W would this be an alternative way of stating what you just said, or would you mod this, which is essentially what Bitcoin has done is it's reinvented the platform as Ledger, and that that Ledger now can be innovated on in various ways, extended, apps can be built on, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that accessibility then allows essentially geeks, designers, engineers, to begin hacking on and that's what opens up innovation. Is that what you, or is it something else? It, well, so, so there's, a, there's a couple different layers, mm -hmm. right? So there's Bitcoin itself possibly mm -hmm. evolving into something that could mm -hmm. be a platform. Um, internet did it in its own sort of mm -hmm. way. Um, but it's also just kind of focusing a lot of smart, it's like the brain. So mm -hmm. the brain, when we were growing up, no one studied the brain. Mm -hmm. The brain was one of the most underfunded things ever. I mean, considering how important it was. Mm -hmm. Um, I was to say, I think there was there was yeah, no, no, but, but but considering <laughs> how important it is for us, uh -huh. no one yes. really spent money on yeah. funding it. But now it's the thing. Obama's mm. talking about it. So, so but mm. it's when you get a lot of smart people geeking out on something, it creates a sort of critical mass. Mm. And because also smart people want to hang out with smart people. Mm. And and you know, you, and, 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 and I see Accenture here and stuff like that. Nothing against accountants, <laughs> but the, the 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 image of an accounting mm. firm. Is not the, the image where you're like the, you know, the physics, math quant person is going to want to go. I mean, at MIT there are the you know people who do like quantum accounting. I mean, there there are the fringe people who are really into advanced accounting. But the general undergraduate student. I'm not even sure I know what quantum accounting is, but okay. okay. <laughs> um, but 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 the general undergraduate. Stop there student, until you measure it. I mean, I'm, anyway, sorry. Well, it's, it's, Schrodinger. It's, 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 Schrodinger's it's, it's, books. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It is. It is actually <laughs> related to that. Uh, but 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 I guess the thing is just having a, a volume of people because also mm -hmm. this is this, a lot of innovation comes out of trying a lot of things, <laughs> right? And so so to me that 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 Bitcoin is bringing attention mm -hmm. to, uh, to an area that that sorely needed. Mm. A lot of um, brain power attention mm. because I because I think a lot of the the stuff that's screwed up whether you're talking about network security or the fragility of the systems I'm on the audit committee at the mm. New York Times which is giving me a view into how unviewable mm -hmm. um, our financial system is and so so a lot of these things I think when people start figuring well why don't we just do this why don't we just yeah. do that so I agree with everything you said by the way in terms of the Bitcoin stuff I would add one thing that I think is important to add to that view which is. Part of the, the notion of can, if you can create an effectively distri network distributed integral trust system where the trust resolve, resides in the network mm -hmm. and all the network, and not just one node, one node of authority, mm -hmm. that allows all kinds of new innovation to be created on top of it. Now, Ledger is absolutely one of the important right, things. Right, right, right. But there's a various things. Like Bitcoin has been making me think about how DNS should work, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, yeah. for the internet and these yeah. sorts of things. Like, yeah. There's a bunch of, of, of Potential unlockings by having the network be the mm -hmm. the, the 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 authority. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that's that's right. And I think a lot of us have thought about like I was on the ICANN board, mm -hmm. and, and we thought mm -hmm. a lot about DNS and trust and yep. security DNS, but it it definitely lights a fire under it when it's suddenly money more money involved, right? Yes, so, yes, yes. So I think Bitcoin is you know is 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 fanning a lot mm -hmm. of really important um, you know flames that need to be fanned. So. Let's shift to, um, and uh, in a few minutes, uh, I'll, by the way, I'll be asking questions in the audience as well. Uh, and the questions can come to either of us about anything that the whole group would be interested in. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about the future university, mm -hmm. right? And you know, one of the things that, you know, the memes that go around Silicon Valley frequently are uh, we disrupt industries, we think about how disruption, one of the best definitions of disruption I tend to work with is you take $10 of what is revenue or GDP and now replace $1, and that $1 then becomes a platform enabling other things. That's part of the reason why the disruptive cycle is you know, the Schumpeter creative destruction, and, and it's important. And you know, obviously, people have been kicking around a lot of stuff. You've got Coursera here. You've got Udacity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, you've got you know media. You know, MIT did its own MITx. Yeah, yeah MITx. Um, and so there's been a lot of thinking about what the future of the university is going to be. What are your, you know, at least partial perspectives on that from a media lab and other? Yeah. So. So I, there's, there's, so there's a future of education, which mm. is a, a, a broader thing in which the future of university is part of. And I think, and it, and it ties to your book as well, I, I, th I don't think that we're preparing people 
to be fully functional because just, and, and, and I think you can blame it all the way, you can go up to Carnegie, but you can also blame it on the companies who are hiring people because they have degrees or they have grades because that drives a, a testing culture to make sure that people meet the requirements for the degree. And the tests are usually about you as an individual, so it's not that much about collaboration. It's um, literally tests of skills and knowledge, um, which is great for, you know, if you're in a factory um, or if you're stuck on top of a mountain with a number two pencil and no mobile phone. <laughs> but in most cases, you're gonna have a mobile phone, you're gonna have Wikipedia, mm -hmm. and your value to society is going to be how can you pull the people and the knowledge that you need when you need it and then turn it into something valuable. And it's this ability to produce, the ability to think, the ability to ask questions. And those are not easy to assess. But you know, I'm even in, my, even in the media lab where it's almost the opposite of that, when I do a tenure case or when I'm, uh, I'm hiring a faculty member, it's, but this paper has multiple authors. How do we know that it was this person's contribution? You know, is there a single paper that this person is, is, is heavily cited? And, and what did this person do by themselves? You know? And it's always by themselves. And, and so it's not about networking. And, it's, and obviously being cited and stuff like that has, is sort of networking, but it's networking in kind of a one-dimensional way. And so, so to me, you know, preparing people for assuming that they're networked mm. and assuming that skills and knowledge are less important than ability to gain those skills and the, the knowledge when you need them, rather than having to, because to me, university feels like, okay, you have to memorize the encyclopedia before you're allowed to go out and do anything, mm -hmm. um, is the opposite, because you have the encyclopedia in your pocket now. So, so, so that shift away from packing knowledge in your brain into being creative, and, 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 and I think it makes sense, because in a, in a society where Machines were not ma machines and computers are not yet strong enough to do the repetitive tasks mm -hmm. humans needed to do in the industrial revolution. You wanted reliable, similar, standardized human beings as units of work. Mm -hmm. But today, when robots and computers are doing everything it, that is repeatable or that they can do, mm -hmm. you don't want computers that act like robots and human beings, which is sort of or robots and and computers, which is sort of what a lot of universities try to create. Right. So, so I think that there's, that's, that's the big problem. Mm -hmm. And then kind of there's a whole bunch of stuff on how you do would do Do you have it. any suggestions on what the mods are? Right, because most of the dialogue that I see happen within the university system is, it's kind of like, are MOOCs sufficient, would be the way of putting the question. And, mm -hmm. and to some degree, it's a trivial answer. Of course, they're not sufficient. Mm -hmm. But of course, they're one innovation along a path to how do we change the outcomes, both in cost and results. Right. So, so, so I think, the, I think MOOCs are an, uh, a better knowledge and skill delivery system, mm -hmm. but knowledge and skill delivery is the one thing that I think we need to not do as much of. Mm. But they will argue that if you make that part more efficient, you have more time for the other stuff. So the, 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 the word that is often used is called the flipped classroom. Instead of mm -hmm. sitting with butts in your seat listening to a lecture, you watch a lecture at home and you come and you interact when you're at the university, so, so that, that sort of makes sense. Although I would kind of argue that having said that, when well, you're putting all your money and all of your energy in building the knowledge delivery system, but we really don't sit around talking about, well, now that we have the time in the class, what do we do um, and how do we make that more, more effective? Um, we, we, we are doing um, more peer learning mm -hmm. online. So we're, we're, we did this thing called um, uh, learning creative learning where we said okay well we're not going to teach you anything you're going to teach yourselves we'll have a guided conversation we'll set up communities and I think 25,000 people sort of showed up 10,000 stayed in but we didn't give any degrees we didn't give any points and halfway through the community started making their own software and t to me that's much more interesting also which is when you look at open source software it's, it's peer learning, like Mozilla, we're both involved in Mozilla. I mean, people teach each other, and, and you learn, everybody knows you learn more when you're teaching, right? And so, so the idea of like this master journeyman apprentice model of a network system, and so I think seven billion teachers is a much mm -hmm. more interesting goal mm -hmm. than um, one person teaching seven billion people, which is kind of the MOOC model. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's a role for them, mm -hmm. but I, I think that, 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 that the social also behavior of learning and teaching mm -hmm. is also really important because I still think that especially in the developing world, everybody wants that degree to get that job. To, mm -hmm. and, and it all goes back to jobs. And, and you will spend a lot of money to get a degree, 
But the problem also when you're degree driven, is you're spending all your time focused on getting out of school, mm -hmm. right? That's the whole point is to get out of here, mm -hmm. get my degree and get out of here. But well, what about, what it, you know, so when I, when, so for my first year PhD students, which are the ones that we get for four years, I say, always imagine that I may just take your degree away when you're leaving. Say, psych. And then I, 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 I want you to be able to look back and say it was still worth it. And to think about the degree as a scaffolding for you having an amazing time and learning a lot of stuff. Otherwise, I don't want you here. I want people here who, are, who don't want to leave. You know. Mm -hmm. um. Yep, so I think we'll shift to questions now. I still have a stack, uh, and I think there, I, all I'm supposed to do is say next question, and then the folks here uh, will tell me who the, so you're selecting, or am I selecting? We have okay, here. great, okay. Yep. Here. great. So, um, Reed, just uh, thank you for that slight presentation on the startup of you. Mm -hmm. I had the pleasure of sitting with my niece, who's in 10th grade, and telling her all about it and how she should figure her life out with those slides. We got up to slide number 100 and something, and then she started <laughs> getting bored, but it was really worth it. So thank you. And, um, you know, the, the question I have is, um, we talk about Bitcoin, mm. and we talk about trust, and uh, we talk about all these uh, issues that are you know, almost transnational at this point, right? And as we've seen with Google as well, the regulatory environment in EU is kind of came out of left field, we have no idea. Um, how is an entrepreneur, how are these, or how are a community of entrepreneurs mm. going to confront some of these fairly complex transnational issues mm. where nation states do have mm a real cause for concern. I mean, they do have a real cause. So any, any thoughts on the Bitcoin angle and from both of you actually, yep, that'd be great. Yep, uh, happy to. Um, so uh, one of the things that's uh, wondrous and complicating and hopefully not terrible about being more and more in the networked age, which is part of how I refer to what we are, is the network essentially gets a inertia and a life to its own such that innovations and changes and things can happen in ways that aren't under a classic nation state control. Uh, and you know, Bitcoin is, one, is, is precisely one of those things because if you actually look at the vast majority of, like one of the ways that um, uh, countries you know, have historically worked is the banking system is very tightly regulated by the country and then there is specific cross-border uh, cross, um, cross regulatory infrastructure that causes um, that causes it very difficult to drive innovations across it. And that actually goes all the way back to the PayPal and how do you launch Japan and how Joey and I met. So, um, and you know, part of the question will then be is, like for example, I think that, you know, it's gonna be very difficult for government folks to figure out how should modern treaties be expressed? Should they be expressed in code, <laughs> right? Uh, what are the kinds of principles in that? This is one of the reasons why Joey and I both, you know, Joey's on the foundation board, I'm on the corporation board of Mozilla. Um, and so in terms of guidance for entrepreneurs, it's a question of to say, well, uh, understand that, uh, that part of his technology is changing the world, that there will be friction points with regulation, there'll be friction points with government, and you have, to you have to have that as part of your thinking about what your startup plan is going to be, what you're going to be doing. And, um, and so the, what I do personally there is I look at whether it's Bitcoin in financial services or Airbnb and kind of zoning regulation, as I go, okay, what should the mature design of the ecosystem be? Why is that better for all the individuals? Why is that also better for society? And then how do you step in the way to do that and recognize that there will be a number of, of places where you'll be reconciling, helping the system change as that happens. And so, for example, in the case of Airbnb, it's like, well, it's better for a bunch of the individuals because people can then uh, you know, kind of sublet rooms or apartments in ways that offer unique experiences, create income for themselves, that kind of, you know, that kind of income creation is valuable for, the, for, the, for a region, and for service, for individuals, and then also for travelers, they get a unique kind of experience. So it's valuable for both in terms of how it plays, and that's, that's the kind of thing, 
And by the way, you know, there's regulatory issues for Airbnb in the cities, but there's also in other countries, so the, the transnational. This could be a subject of an entire hour's talk itself, so I'm going to stop there and then so, yeah, and I guess the Joe only thing I would say is um, I'm a little disappointed by the lack of creativity in institution hacking by people who should be more innovative. And I think partially it's because Silicon Valley exists in a slight bubble, and it exists because they were able to ignore a lot of institutions by being out here. Um, on the East Coast, one of the things that you do see is you see a lot of interesting hackers who have hacked their way into a funny situation in, in government, in the military, in large institutions. And also you see a lot of nonprofits, some of them out here, who are very creative at, at figuring out how, whether it's the overthrow of governments to figuring out how to do something creative. You see Google hiring the exact same lobbyists that AT&T hires, doing the same old fashioned lobbying. And you know, I, they don't, I, I realize they don't have time to be innovative in that space, mm. but, but it, 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 I, I wish that there was a little bit more energy. But the, I think partially, this is, you don't make money being a, a regula regulatory hacker, mm -hmm. but you make a lot of money hacking companies, right? So, so I, I think part, one of those things that maybe this is a regional collaboration that we do, mm -hmm. but, but a lot of kids at the Media Lab, for instance, our Center for Civic Media, mm -hmm. they spend their whole life trying to figure out disruptive ways to do regulatory changes and things like that, mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe that's something. I mean, well, Google does talk to us about that stuff, but, mm -hmm. but I think that's, we, we could do more of that. Next question. Hi, good evening. Hi. Reed and uh, Joy, wonderful <laughs> conversations. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I was very, uh, I guess, excited by the conversation about the University of Future and uh, how you need to bring the element of uh, uh, social element of uh, cooperation into that. and. Uh, uh, it reminded me of this conversation I had with uh, one of the professors at Stanford and the Department of Education that uh, we were talking, what is really needed is uh, teach people how to connect the dots and how to synthesize tons of information coming at them and picking up the right thing and connect the dots. And one thing that uh, was very interesting was I remembered the leadership class I took uh, 30 years ago at HP they gave us different information to five of us without us knowing it and said to come up with an answer and we were fighting with each other till one of us finally said, let me see your information that you have. And they were trying to teach us to communicate. <laughs> My question, I guess, and this is, how do we test that ability of people who can communicate, connect the dots and get that? Because I've been since my conversation about six months ago on this with this uh, university professor, uh, I've really been struggling on, uh, okay, <laughs> how do we define? We say forget about the way of testing in the past, that uh, mm -hmm. you memorize something, as you say, you sit on top of a mountain with a pencil and try to answer it. How do we uh, do this test? My proposal was allow people to bring their laptops, bring their friends, if they can con somebody, <laughs> five of their friends to come and sit there, it says they have leadership ability and makes sense, but I don't know whether that's realistic or not. Do you guys have any comments on that? Well, actually, this is, that's a great question, actually. The, um, I'm working on an essay on network literacy in terms of how to think about, like, for example, uh, as you go through different phases of the information age, um, different kinds of literacy are important, not just the literacy of reading and writing language, but search literacy, and I actually think network literacy is one of the points of literacy that's becoming, and it's everything from a literacy of how do you search networks to also how do you network within people. Um, but a test for that, <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure I have a good answer off. Do you have a good answer off the top well, of your I head? I mean, LinkedIn sort of is a version of this, which is y you, you know, your references are kind yeah, of a, that's a, a test. I mean, if, yep. if it depends where you are in your career. I mean, you're not going to do this with a, a ten-year-old, yeah. yeah. but if if you're an adult, the network that you've created shows both your taste mm -hmm. and your 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 aptitude, right? Yep. Um, I think that uh, uh, there was an interesting article. I think mm -hmm. from February uh, in the New York Times by. I'm a, a great newspaper, by the way. Um, um, <laughs> One that you happen to be <laughs> but, on the board of. Uh, but it was, it was the Google HR person saying that um, grade point average ha seems to have no statistically oh, relevant. Laszlo Bach. Uh, yeah, Laszlo Bach. Yep. Was saying that it has no statistically relevant, is not statistically relevant in how well the person does. 
and that now some teams in Google have up to 14% um, college dropouts, which is a departure from their GPA, Stanford degree-driven hiring. And, but I don't think they've figured out how to change it. They, but they have data that shows that just focusing on GPA isn't right. And I think everyone's struggling a little bit with the assessment. It was funny, there was a company that does do assessments, and the head of assessments in HR was at the Media Lab. And we gave her a demo, and she talked, and she came back, she says, I've already found eight people that I want to hire. And I said, how did you decide you wanted to hire them? And, and I said, did you give them a test? And I said, no, but I talked to them, and I, I knew right away that they, were, they would fit in perfectly. And I said, ha, ah. and she goes, you know, and, and, and so, so because and, and, you know, her whole job was trying to quantify the assessment mm -hmm. system. I think the hardest part is really going to be how do you scale it, right? So how right. do you, so like if you come to the Media Lab, we have gone through, you know, hundreds of applicants to narrow them down to a couple dozen, and then we then work on them so that the, your, your return is pretty high on your investment of talking to kids. But if you're getting a million applications, how do you sort for the first bunch? Because I do think, and I think there was an IBM study at least, and I, I heard this in IBM Japan, this is now foggy memory, so don't quote me on this, but, but there was a study on who did the, assess, the interviews and then how well the person did later. Um, and the, the, the more senior and sort of so-called wise, but, but probably looking at different things, the more senior the interviewer, the more likely the person being hired had that aptitude. And people tended not to want to hire people who were more senior than themselves and things like that. So, so the, the interview process, I think, has a lot of human nature built in that figures a lot of this stuff out. But the, I think the harder part is how do you how do you do that? Because I think Google has actually in, in that article it talks about you know we, we ask these kinds of questions and it's, it's a very tricky way of trying to figure out whether somebody's a thinker. But but they still have to filter the the, the, in, the inbound. Next question. Hey Reid. Hey uh, Joey. Um, I guess in the world where there's so many more things than there are people now, and um, our identity is becoming sort of a function of LinkedIn and a variety of other things, how do you think, you know, do you think we're going to have our own personal network that we take with us to somebody else's house or to work mm -hmm. or to a hotel or, you know, what do you think of this whole concept of taking your network with you and having some kind of security and privacy and identity around that? Just a refinement. Do you mean network as in people, or do you mean network as in like will be wearables and cybernetics, it's or both? More, more your identity. So mm -hmm. you know, if if for example, in our house we only have one SSID, which most mm -hmm. people have, but I think we're going to have to have more than that because mm -hmm. we're going to have guests and we're going to have our finances, our finances, our health, and all that. And then as we move around. Um, you know, we become a function of this sort of network identity mm. and, and, and or the vice versa, our network identity becomes a function of the things that we have. Mm. I mean, there must be some thought around IoT and identity going on, right? Do you want to start and then I'll add in? Yeah, sure. Um, so so I, I think this is the problem, right? And I think talking about trust, trust networks, identity within trust networks, what sorts of identities and identifiers are necessarily to complete the right transactions? But, but, but I think in the world of big data and now with NSA and everything, the idea of, like, like for, for instance, you know, if I'm going to a library, there's no reason the guard at the library has to know my name and where I live. They just need to know that this person's face links with a membership to the library and should be allowed access. And so there's a sort of fundamental thing, which is I think there should be a, a minimum amount of identity necessary to complete any particular transaction is what you should be forced to reveal. And I think that, 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 that the, um, the architecture of identity is going to have to change um, to be focused more on what is necessarily to complete this loop of trust in order for something to happen. And, and I, and, and, and that's going to change eventually because I think the market's going to demand it. But, but just like spam and just like security and everything else, it, it will only change. Because we all know private enhancement technology is something I've been working on f since the internet started. And nobody will buy it because nobody wants it. And, so, and I think it's like spam. It has to get really painful before, before people are willing to say, I'm not going to use this anymore. Because there was, remember the time when everyone said, oh, the internet's broken, we can't use it anymore. Spam has destroyed it. And then finally the company said, okay, we'll fix it. And they fixed it. And I think with a lot of the identity stuff, what's going to happen is people are going to start getting hurt 
They're going to get identity with that. It's going to get worse before it gets better. But when the, the once it gets better version, I think is going to have a lot more personalized identity with a lot more control and transparent. And I think the other important thing is transparency of those who use your information because you're going to get it collected anyway. But to me, the worst thing in the world that, that stress, stresses me out is what is the model that they have about me? Like right now, I can't get TSA pre. And so I, I, I went through every single network I could possibly find until I finally found somebody important enough to be able to tell me that, oh, well, it turns out the lawful permanent resident database, there's a glitch in the connection with the TSA pre-database, and so that's why you're not getting it. <laughs> and so, so stop trying to fix it. But then, my, but then my wife got it this morning, so go figure. But, 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 what's, but to me, is I don't want to end up on a no-fly list where they may have information that's wrong about me. And I think the ability to go in and change that, I think, is going to be key. I think I agree with a lot of those principles. I mean, the other two things to add is, obviously, the bar is moving relative to what's the amount of publicity about my identity that provides valuable services to me, mm -hmm. right? And you know, a what do you lot. think about the Google ruling? Uh, which one? So the one in Europe that made it, um, that, that's saying the, that Google can't can forget the, for, the forget the yeah. forget ruling. I think, generally speaking, I think that's a good thing, especially as it applies to companies. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that one of the the kind of the nuances is is so, for example, um, you have to you always have to look at in ecosystem design unintended consequences. So, mm -hmm. for example. People trying to hack financial systems, and you know, and fraudsters. is actually one of the things. The whole thing is you actually want to remember information mm -hmm. in order to have a robust. So you have to have some kind of. There's always these kind of principles of balance yep. in terms of how do you how do you construct it. And I also think that one of the things that what happens is frequently when you frame privacy things and you say, well, we're just going to take this data and do something you don't know about it. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, that sounds terrible. It's like, oh, but we're going to provide this service that you really like. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a little bit of like the kind of the Facebook thing. It's like, okay, your friends are going to upload pictures. Other friends are going to tag them. And then it's going to be shown to all your friends before you get a chance to see them. You can kind of redact it. What do you think about that? And you say, well, oh, that sounds a little scary to me. And then everyone uses Facebook because like, oh, actually, in fact, this constructs a live stream of actually uh, moments that mattered to me in terms of, and then the system self-regulates. So I think the bar shifts, I think, is one thing on that. And then the other thing is, is it gets a lot more, um, the other the other issue on identity that's going to be solved is that there's a lot of things where group patterns and identity will actually seriously help the overall efficiency of society, anything from medicine, right, you know, kind of genetic coding and these sorts of things to traffic patterns, mm -hmm. and how do we sort out individual rights versus collective rights there mm -hmm. is, is kind of seriously interesting. To give you an example, one of the things, and this is not quite the identity question, but when Joey and I were driving here down 101, we were talking about how self-driving cars will change all kinds of things, and one of the questions that Joey put to me, which I hadn't thought about before, which I'm now thinking about, is if your car knew that by doing this and driving this way would kill you, but would save two other lives, what should the car do? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, complicated question. But those are the kinds of questions we're going to get into. Yeah. So. And I think the bioengineering is actually going to, so, so one, one pro tip, according to George Church, bioengineering is going, dropping in price at six times Moore's Law in many of the areas. So you know, personal genes, gene sequencing will be like, probably within a couple of years, you'll all probably want to do it. And then CRISP is this new protein technology that goes in that you can go and edit very cheaply your genes. And so we will probably in our lifetime be modifying genes of our children and ourselves to start to eliminate certain things. The, the bioethical Quite scary in conversation all kinds around that. And, and, and he's also starting to research personal biospheres because he feels that an um, extinction event by an accidental mm -hmm. teenager is, is, a, is a real risk now. Because of bi because of being able to hack biology. Yeah. yeah. With that, next question. <laughs> okay. Um, I I come from uh, the world of uh, digital fabrication and advanced manufacturing, and I'm kind of curious as to y'all's advice for those that are bringing innovation into industries where you're going to have a serious restructure of skill sets for people who are mm -hmm. normally very hesitant toward uh, change. So I think one of the there's um, a pair of MIT professors, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andy McAfee, who also uh, worry about this topic. And their general worry is with the changing disruption, you know, how do you have 
the right kind of ability for labor force to retool in order to stay employed. And I think the, the, the broad level answer to this is, is taking the same kind of techniques for transforming how ongoing education goes, how um, an ability to kind of uh, do continuous learning throughout your career, not to have this old industrial model, because you know where it's like, well, I had the time where I'm a student, and now I'm in the factory, or I'm now in the field. Like it's like, no, no, you have to be learning every year, and that has to be an ongoing pattern. Is part of how we're all kind of, I think, all modern careers, especially professional careers, are trending to, and that's one of the reasons why the, the notion of ongoing education and constant retooling is important. Um, and so I think you have to then figure out how we deploy these technologies in order to help with that as the outcome for people who are in the work f workforce. I don't know if there's anything you'd add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, it is going to be harder for the more senior and half-retired people who don't want to or don't have the incentive to put the investment into trying to retool. But for the young kids, I, I know like um, Van Jones and others are doing the Yes, We Code. I mean, the, for a lot of the, uh, you know, um, the the less advantaged neighborhoods learning to code um, provides a, a tremendous opportunity and there's a that's a market failure where we just don't have enough coders and learning to code is actually possible i mean it's 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 it, it turns out it's it's not that hard and you can you can also it, again with the peer learning there is a cellular division model so if you teach people how to do pair programming you can start involving people who are less experienced and it sort of scales. You don't need tons and tons of infrastructure to do that. So, so I think l teaching kids to code, and it's not, it's, it's interesting because I think that the, 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 the workshops that they've started to do have been extremely successful. It's not like the intuitive thing to do, but it's the obvious thing when you look at the numbers. Um, and so I think that's, that's, I think, going to be a pretty successful initiative. Next question. Hey, gentlemen. So uh, in the last century, a fellow named Karl Marx suggested that there be the withering away of the nation state, which didn't happen in the way that he suggested. <laughs> However, what you're talking about net with networks and what George is doing with biology tends to think that institutions aren't going to keep up. And we've talked a little bit about that with universities and so forth. What do you think can happen to, um, to en enable them to keep up? Or what will enable us when we have today you know, trying to take the government trying to take on the Chinese, uh, and maybe there might be a little bit of back and forth on that. What do you think will, will get us beyond or transcend some of those issues that can help the institutions keep up with what we're doing? Why don't you start? Well, so, so Joshua Ramo, um, who's the managing director of Kissinger Associates, has a book called Age of the Unthinkable. Awesome book. It's a good book. Well worth reading. Yeah. It's, he's, you know, he, he, his background is in physics, Santa Fe Institute, complexity, but he's now kind of at the helm of really thinking about um, um, international relations, he's one of the key experts on China. But he's doing like um, ultimatum theory, game, game theory analysis. I mean, the, the problem is international relations, relations and statesmanship is still in the dark ages. Yeah. And what, what it is, is now it's happening in a world of extreme complexity. I spend a lot of time in the Middle East, and it's, it's as complex, it's so complex that you can't really parse it in any, it, 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 it's, I mean, it, it doesn't solve. It's, it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like a, it's like in hyperspace. It's not, it's not in the Euclidean space. And so, so I think what needs to happen is just like every other industry that had, you know, physicists and people who understand math jump in and try to model things in a different way. I think the military and, the, and international relations is, needs that. The problem is that there isn't a strong flow of people into those in, in, into that sector because of the way that institutions are set up. And so to your point, I think about when you think about when I think about the institutions, I think about programs like um, um, Code for America and others. At the municipal level, you can see some trickling in, but it's, it's, it's how do you do impact? I think nonprofits and NGOs can help. But, but, I, but I do think that, so at the Media Lab, I do see a lot of you know, physics nerds getting interested in things like international relations, um, getting interested in trying to f solve Syria, um, and, and modeling those as physics problems and network problems rather than, um, rather than you know, text. Um, so, so I think it'll take a while, but I think part of it will be coming up with the right models and then having enough senior administration that can parse it. And I think right now, um, and we see this failure already starkly in cybersecurity, where the, 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 the senior people just don't use computers, so they don't understand kind of emotionally or viscerally what's going on, and the fact that you know, a bunch of teenagers could actually 
you know, cause a lot of havoc and don't because they don't want to kill their host. That's, that's the power dynamic and g get used to it. You, know, you don't have control, you know. <laughs> um, so two things to add into that. Uh, one is, uh, you know, Mark Pincus has generated an idea that I think is very interesting, which is create a digital West Point because you essentially need to have, and this relates to the second idea, is you need to have more engineers or hackers or geeks, nerds, as actors within these institutions. Um, and so typically one of the problems is the way that a programmer is thought of in very old school institutions, which includes governments, is like, well, I will write out exactly what you do and then you go do it, <laughs> right? And it's like, no, no, actually you have to figure out how to treat these things more organic systems. You have to figure out how to hack them. You have to figure out how to possibly create new things in them. And that was part of like the throwaway comment I made earlier about, um, you know, well, what happens if you can write treaties in code or yeah. should code, treaties be in code? And for example, if people want something to kind of funnily think about, you know, when Bitcoin is, a, is an international network distributed ledger, one of the things you could do in a cyber treaty is you could actually articulate financial penalties in Bitcoin that would automatically be triggered. So if I did something, the Bitcoin would essentially, as a country, the Bitcoin essentially would be transferred as opposed to, the way the system works today, which is, no, I'm not going to pay it, or you know, that kind of thing. You know, there's all kinds of interesting things about hacking it. The second thing is, is that it's, I think, extremely important. That's one of the reasons why you know, uh, love organizations like the Churchill Club and so forth, to actually have the dialogue about this, to understand where the future is going. And, and, and part of, um, one of the things I've, I've, I've told a number of, of US politicians is it's stunning to me how many times the ratio of foreign politicians I host here in Silicon Valley relative to domestic ones, right? Like, it's like, guys, come out and talk. <laughs> it really matters. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, and uh, let me put this way, like the shadow chancellor of the, uh, the, the actually the chancellor of the, of the Czech of the UK was the shadow chancellor at the time, George Osborne, spent a week out here trying to figure out what was going on so he knew how to help the UK. It was like, that's a really great thing. <laughs> and so that sort of thing I think would be another uh, partial answer. Next question. How are you guys doing? I think you guys are both great. Uh, I have a comment for uh, Mr. Ito regarding the uh, Silicon Valley model of um, putting something up and then back it in, trying to find a business model for that. Richard Branson just wrote an article on LinkedIn. It was uh, uh, innovating the model. Does anybody talk about hacking the business model at the Media Lab, and are you concerned about that going forward in terms of the money we spend in terms of innovating without real business models going forward? Well, I, I think Reed may be able to even answer <laughs> better than me. I mean, I, I don't think that not focusing on revenue is not having a business model. I think the idea that distribution and scale have tremendous business value and are the harder part of the problem. And that once you have distribution and scale, it's easy to get meetings, it's easy to generate cash, and that the traditional obsession on the so-called business model, which is actually roughly translated by some people into the wrong thing, which is cash flow, um, it's, it's a, it's a short-sighted focus. You know. And so, so, so to me, I don't think it's that these companies like Twitter and others aren't focusing on a business model. It is a business model to focus on on, on things like scale. Um, I think at the Media Lab, we we tend not to focus on. We we focus on impact. We want to hit the real world, but a lot of our stuff intentionally is answers looking for questions because sometimes you'll discover stuff that wouldn't normally be allowed to be searched for if your focus was on something with utility from the beginning. And so we're even, I think at the Media Lab, we're even more sort of discovery and search oriented than in Silicon Valley. But do you want to talk a little bit about business models? Well, I think the high line is actually, in fact, business model hacking is one of the things that's better done on the startup and venture side mm -hmm. than it is on the university side. Because mm -hmm. we have much better understanding about how these ecosystems potentially come together than mm -hmm. almost anyone, in, even in really advanced places or unique places in the academy like the Media Lab, mm -hmm. we have a much better sense of that. Now, I do think that everything you said is right, which is frequently one of the things that happens in consumer internet is actually get to scale first matters, sometimes different other areas, but in mm -hmm. consumer, and because that, that's a harder problem than the business model problem. Mm -hmm. 
Now that being said, I think that one of the things that's interesting is, um, is frequently what happens is people get to scale for consumer internet and then they forget that there's additional business model innovation that you can do. I mean, that's the thing that made Google its powerhouse was AdWords, right? It was like, it wasn't just, oh, we have X page views, we actually have a business model that goes with it. Uh, you're seeing similar things happening now with um, you know, the kind of the news feed sponsored update innovations, which are creating interesting ad models, which you know, are kind of uh, new iterations in the product. I think what Google is doing at the YouTube with TrueView is actually an interesting, and so is to think about business model innovations and hacking is actually an important part of the entrepreneurial process. Now, for consumer internet investments, frequently it's, it's irrelevant unless you get to millions, hundreds of millions of people. So if you haven't figured out your distribution, like, like when, when an entrepreneur comes to me for the consumer and says, what should I focus on first? Like, focus on distribution. Mm -hmm. Like, do think about hacking the business model later and then have a little, some thought to it, but get to that after you've solved the distribution but, problem. But I do, I do think, though, the place where we do get to hack a little bit is mm -hmm. um, there's a certain kind of scale that you need to be at before you can hack a business model in a certain way, yes, true. Right? you have to have yep. at least one user. You know? Yes, <laughs> so 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 <laughs> usually and, and, more than one. Yeah. But but the good, the thing that we get is we get eighty companies telling mm -hmm. us their deepest darkest secrets yep. about where they think they're gonna die. Yep. You know? And then we get to sort of say, well, what have, what about this? What about that? You know? And so mm -hmm. so and, and they'll test it. And yep. so so and even at the New York Times, we will mm -hmm. test things like the you know the paywall and stuff yep. like that. And so 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 there's a certain kind of business model hacking that you do once you've got a platform mm -hmm. or a brand. That you can't do if you're just a, a startup with, you know, just in the in the early early phase. Right? Yes, although that's yeah, a long yeah, conversation. So. <laughs> I think this is the last question. Okay, we have we have one here. Okay. <clears throat> so we heard a, a moment ago that uh, you can't make money from hacking regulations, and I know that's not true because I've done it. There's mm -hmm. been a Cambrian explosion of law-related startups that are trying to hack at regulatory mm -hmm. anomalies, mm -hmm. you know, friction, that kind of thing. What I've really noticed coming from east to west is that people don't care. They don't care about things that are outside their bubble. They don't care about hunger, human rights. And th that's not as true in the east. You guys are uniquely positioned uh, to talk about social innovation in the Bay Area and how to do that. So how do you burst the bubble and get people in the Bay hacking sort of big, big social problems that are global in nature? Let me shift your question slightly, although I'm not, I will answer the full thing. So, because this is, I um, serve on a board, a bunch of nonprofits. You know, I've actually had Paul Farmer, who's partners in health, come out here several times to connect to the Valley. What I've realized in terms of the Valley's focus, the Valley is very much kind of otaku about technology and entrepreneurship. And that's a Japanese word for kind of like obsessive geek. And, and so what I have found, the way to get resonance on whether it's, it's, it's hunger or, edu or education, there's some interest in because of talent and all the rest, um, you know, international relations, is to put it, to make it somewhat navigable by that skill set. Like how does that skill set or how do those things, entrepreneurship and technology, apply to this? And then they start getting very interested because it's kind of it's a strong interest on these two things. They don't kind of go, oh, I'm just trying to solve you know, world hunger, they go, I've got these tools that are really interesting and you can create this massive disruptive breakout thing. They say, oh, and here's how you apply them to this. And so, for example, when you, if you would go to people and say, well, um, you know, uh, microfinance, it's like, okay, that's kind of interesting. Kiva, oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> right? that, that, that's the kind of pattern that frequently happens and that would be one part that, that I would answer mm -hmm. in that. But. No, I, I, think, I, I think that's, um, I think that's right. I, 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 I think that maybe there's some East Coast, West Coast bridging that could be useful because, you know, I think a lot of the, like Knight Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, we fund a lot of startups that have a really interesting social mission but don't have a lot of nerd firepower. And I think the success mm -hmm. of things like Code for America where you, you, you go out and suddenly you realize that you walk into an environment where your skills are able to completely change a city or to completely change a whole bunch of people, and then you get addicted to it. It's kind of like the modern version of the Peace Corps. You know, I think if we would just to send some of these geeks out for just a year, take a break, <laughs> go, go off and do something interesting, go to Africa and come back, they may get the bug. You know? And I, I think that a lot of it has to do with being in an environment where you're pretty safe, where you don't have to focus on the world news. Um, I think it's a little bit about getting out more. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, <laughs> geeks get out more. That, that could be a tagline. I, I, think we're, I think that's it. Reed and Joey, want to thank you so much. You have been so generous with your time and with your thoughts, and we really appreciate it, right? <laughs>